you know, going to be completely crazy. Uh, but here's one way to look at it. Even if we invent the most amazing AI ever, I'll call it GPT-9, okay, and it can do everything, and it's, uh, you know, and it's a small model, and it's very cheap. Uh, if no human uses it, then it actually will have zero impact on the planet. I go to conference after conference, people are talking about technology and AI strategy. Most of them are budgeting, by the way. I can tell you for a fact, if you don't understand the human element, you are driving on a highway in the wrong direction. Don't listen to some of the best technologists because they are all telling things with an optimization that is beneficial for them. Listen to the psychologists, listen to the sociologists, listen to the greatest philosophers and they will tell you what the truth is. We live in medieval institutions and godlike technology. Sam Altman said this beautifully, we will live in a time of AI, we will create great companies and the world will come to an end and you remove that quote by the way. Okay. And, and you know, we learned very early on um, a, a few key lessons uh, that are, I think, that kind of held true to today. One is, uh, you cannot make AI useful unless you've got domain expertise that you marry alongside AI. So in our case, clearly, you know, having security research sit alongside, you know, the, the data scientists was a very important component. The, the second thing is, and this, this may be for some of you, um, counterintuitive, but all data is not good data. I think that uh, review of everything that we do as a business, understanding what is the fundamental customer problem that you're solving and how you give value to that customer. And you bring that into your in your day-to-day. -day. Look, whether you're a, an engineering leader, whether you're a product manager, whether you are a founder, driving, or even an investor, you have to always focus on what is that unique unsolved problem that is fundamental for the customer that nobody else has solved before. So the opportunity in AI is enormous. We've seen like the technology grow. A lot of people talk about technology growing in a hyperbolic way. I think interestingly technology has grown in a very linear way. It's grown, grown like very consistently, but what's grown in a very, very hyperbolic way has been the, the, the consumer demand. Uh, and the way the customers have adopted the technology, which uh, investment in it. The question is, what is AI? Is AI a sustaining innovation or a disruptive innovation? Since we have limited time, I will tell you that I personally believe AI is actually both. Uh, and there are aspects of AI which are going to play as a sustaining innovation. In other words, they will help incumbents, and there are aspects that will disrupt, uh, that will disrupt the incumbents. And the best example to study for that is Google, Arguably the company that has contributed the most to AI itself, including the original Transformers paper that had so much impact in the more recent work in AI. And yet you see Google struggling in terms of being able to apply AI, what AI will do for Google, etc. I think that story has not been written yet. Um, we will see depending on how they execute, and that's what makes it so fun over here. No, we are, so Postman's mission actually is to create net new developers in the world. Uh, as, as you mentioned, you know, 30 million developers is a lot, and actually that number has been growing, you know, uh, and compounding. But we still have a long way to go. Uh, and our mission is to create 100 million, you know, connected developers uh, who actually build software. Uh, so we believe AI is a net accelerant in that uh, mission. Uh, I think the first place where we looked at AI was uh, really incorporating, uh, you know, kind of AI-based workflows within Postman. So we have an offering called Postbot that uh, you know we are seeing enterprises deploy at scale. It makes every single task that you do with Postman just faster. So whether you're doing API design, documentation, testing, now you have the power of AI behind it. And what I've seen is that most people kind of get used to it. They just are hooked on. So I'm pretty excited about Postbot. Uh, going forward, we are also looking at how can we simplify development for people who will just be building in this AI native world. You will want to pay for software that developers would adopt, and that's just extremely hard to do. Even the stuff that you would buy as enterprise software, you cannot force it on developers. People don't get comfortable at the job you are at. When you're doing really great in your career, that's when you should move and go to a different career. Because A, people will want you because you're doing well. And so you may negotiate a better salary for yourself, and secondly, you will learn something new. I would say move to a job where you know 70% of the content and 30% is new, so you're learning and adding and not taking too big a risk and mm -hmm. reading. They always look for what problem are we trying to solve. It shouldn't be technology for the technology's sake, mm -hmm. right? I think at the 
Dr. Green was uh, talking about technology solutionism. We think technology is the solution for everything. It's not necessary. I just felt like uh, machine learning, data, AI, all this could be useful more directly to help us as human beings. just getting started. So therefore help to build this, uh, build this number one uh, unicorn builder among the IIT community. If you know, a, company, a successful company is going to have thousands of people, and then when there's a thousand people in the company, your role in creating success for that company is less than 1%. So when you started out me, um, you have to you have to have that real belief, um, and you know what with the idea that you have is something that's important, and nobody in the world can convince you otherwise. In fact, you know before we started Glean, um, I was um, like, um, like you know talking to the venture capital you know, um, folks in the industry, um, discussing like raising funds uh, for Glean. Um, and I was actually an experienced entrepreneur. Like before that, I built a successful company called Rubric. Investor who told me that, hey, here's a bank check. You know, you fill it in. You can take as much money as you want because I believe that you can build a company. Uh, but just promise me that you won't work on enterprise search. You know, if, you, if you're going to start a company, then you have to have a very strong learning mindset. Um, first thing that you need to know is, you know, the, um, that, you know, you're not, you're not the best, you know, person like you know for you know for all the tasks that you have to do at a startup. Elon Musk's perspective was why electric cars versus gas cars versus why using Tesla. The fight in the mid '80s or the early '80s to mid '80s was not between Oracle and Sybase or within in, within RDBMS. The fight was between RDBMS and hierarchical databases. It's why should you choose RDBMS more than hierarchical databases? So the fight was at the category level. Salesforce is Amazon meets Siebel. This is about 2001. People knew Amazon, people knew Siebel. Okay, I understand what you do. When he lost, launched App Exchange years yeah. later, he yeah, asked so an established company. It's an eBay for enterprise. Well, I would say the next 15 minutes could increase your win rate by 15% or more if you listen to this presentation. Like in 2006, the most valuable company was Exxon Mobil, who is worth $50 billion. And, and I think only one company out of the top five was a tech company. Now all top five companies in the world are tech companies. And the second prediction is that ironically, the place where AI has had the most impact at the earliest stage is actually on software itself. So software development itself is being impacted with AI. With Microsoft, IBM, and Salesforce, and these reports were specifically on what these three companies, each of them were doing with respect to AI in their organizations and ethics specifically. What was the ethical side of this? How were they implementing ethics in their organizations? 